My name is uh, Donica Halito Achishok Shalubo Hili Fijik. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and member of the White Crane Clan, and I'm Scottish at Clan Ross. And um, I, you, some of you who were listening to my conversation with Eric, I was born and raised in northern New Mexico, um, primarily in a little village outside uh, between Taos and Santa Fe called Chimayo. Um, and uh, I lived in Denver for quite a long time, but I've been up in Portland for um, about eight years now, and I've been at the board for three years, and I'm the behavioral health director at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. And I work on a number of different projects. Um, <clears throat> I uh, work on a behavioral health aid project where we're developing the training uh, for behavioral health aids in the lower 48. And I work on the tribal opioid uh, project um, called the 49 Days of Ceremony, which I'll share a little bit about um, later in the presentation. Um, and then I work on uh, the ACEs COVID um, study or work that we're doing um, with our member tribes as well. And then I kind of consult and do trainings um, across our projects at the board. Um, I have been a drug and alcohol mental health counselor for um, going on about 25 years. Um, and I, I'm also gonna share a little bit about my dissertation work. Um, I got a PhD two years ago and I uh, did a study with um, my tribe um, called the Yapoli Project, um, where we uh, did a, <clears throat> a health promotion initiative um, to focus on uh, substance misuse, diabetes, um, and health prevention. Um, it's a health prevent prevention in, um, intervention. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that study too, because uh, that study in particular kind of informed this presentation. So um, with that, I'll just go ahead and start sharing my slides. Maybe, there we go. Eric, can you see my notes or no? Are we good? <laughs> no, no notes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, for today's presentation, I wanted to kind of talk about um, the in, in, um, integration of uh, traditional indigenous knowledge um, and understanding kind of good health from uh, a whole, more holistic perspective. Um, you know, in Western science, we kind of uh, compartmentalize a lot of disease, quote unquote, diseases. Um, but really, when you look down at the core of those uh, conditions, um, really, there's um, there's really for especially in native communities and other marginalized communities, um, what we're really talking about and dealing with is kind of the impact of colonization um, on a myriad of uh, health conditions. And so, you know, as we we know, health disparities. Um, in particular, substance misuse are increasingly prevalent and costly and deadly in American Indian communities. Um, and American Indian people's health is anchored in a historical context um, at the, and manifests across generations, um, which impacts contemporary forms of health. Native people continue, continue to be disproportionately affected by health disparities in this country and suffer from these devastating consequences, um, including uh, such health conditions as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, alcohol-related diseases, um, accidents, and suicide. Um, over the past several centuries, Native people have endured a series of traumatic events which have had devastating consequences on our health and wellness. Um, Native health is anchored in a historical context and is manifested across generations with impacts contemporary forms of health. The impact of removal from our homelands, from our traditional food sources, uh, grief and loss of culture and identity, and the challenges that Native communities face to reconcile these issues are examples of federally supported acts of genocide against the traditional peoples of these lands that we currently uh, know as the United States. Um, and so the, my presentation and the work that I do is really centered in understanding the impact of colonization um, and particularly historical and intergenerational trauma 
on um, the impact and on health outcomes. And so this is a famous painting that was done called Manifest Destiny, um, which really depicts kind of like the impact of colonization. On one side, you have like this, you know, sun rising, and then you have moving west, this um, industrialization. And over on the left side, you have this dark, ominous storm and these savage Indians running from um, industrialization and progress. Um, and then you have this angelic figure that's like bringing across industrialization. And one of the things that she's holding, and a lot of people misinterpret this, um, they think that the book she's holding is a Bible, but it's not. It's a school book. Um, and as many of us know, you know, the, uh, the consequences of boarding schools have impacted tribal communities to this day. Um, as well as like the way that we understand um, knowledge and research. And so I, I kind of have a pretty scathing kind of critique about Western research and knowledge um, in that it doesn't um, acknowledge or uphold uh, traditional indigenous knowledge. And my argument is, is that we, our knowledge is just as important prior to colonization. Native communities were, we were healthy, thriving people um, and prior and post colonization, we still, even after 500 years, are suffering from dire health consequences. Um, and so, one of the um, um, issues is that we we can think about is that health behaviors, whether they're behavioral health behaviors associated with substance misuse, uh, with eating, um, with food consumption, with exercise, a lot of these behaviors um, are kind of manifest in the same way. And so there's a burgeoning research that's been con conducted with, uh, you know, the National Institutes of Health, uh, looking, at, um, looking at these behaviors. And substance misuse behaviors um, are related to food consumption and each results uh, from a foraging and ingestion habits that persist and strengthen despite the threat of cost catastrophic uh, consequences. Feeding and drug use involve learn habits and the preference, preferences that are stamped in by the reinforcing properties of powerful and repetitive rewards. Um, it feels good to use substances and it feels good to eat. The kind of the difference between um, substance misuse behaviors um, and, and eating behaviors is that we, we need to eat food to survive where we don't necessarily need uh, certain substances to, to survive, but maybe to thrive. And so one of the things that there is kind of a new burgeoning research is how these, uh, be, how these uh, behaviors process in the brain. Um, and there's a lot of research showing that um, there is um, food and substances process in the same uh, ways in the brain. Um, and sugar in particular, there's new research showing that sugar as, is as addictive as cocaine. Um, and it gets processed in the brain in very, very similar ways. Um, and so, you know, what we're seeing in tribal communities um, is that there are these kind of, I, I don't want to say twin epidemics, parallel, parallel epidemics um, around substance misuse um, and eating behaviors. Um, you know, and there are lots of, uh, there, there are lots of things that impact this. Um, we can look at genetic fa uh, factors, you know, individuals su suffering from substance misuse um, or from being overweight or stigmatized uh, in part by the belief that the digestion or overeating or to take drugs is completely a voluntary process. So there's still, there's a lot of stigma for people who are uh, fat or uh, super fat. And then there are all, is also stigma for people who misuse drugs. Um, and there's this belief that, you know, that these behaviors are somehow grounded in people being lazy, being sick, being um, you know morally uh, corrupt, and the reality is is that there are uh, you know a myriad of, of factors that impact 
uh, people's behaviors. Um, there are environmental factors, genetic factors, developmental factors, uh, neurobiological uh, mechanisms in the brain um, that are intimately tied to trauma and, uh, you know, and connection that people have. Um, and then um, neurobiological adaptations, how we uh, adapt to um, the world and how we adapt to stress um, and deal with crisis. And right now, you know, we are in a historical traumatic event with this pandemic, as well as many other events that are currently concurrently happening, like uh, social uprisings and political unrest, all of these things are creating a historical traumatic event that are impacting um, our neurobiological processes um, and are creating adaptations. And, you know, many people are seeking uh, substances and food um, to make themselves feel better. Gabor Mate wrote a book called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, and he talks about in that book, it's, it's an excellent book about, you know, addiction, um, but he talks about in there, you know, the, the root of addiction, whether it, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's food or substances or sex or gambling, is tied to pain. Um, and in our brains, um, where we process emotional pain and physical pain are in the, get processed in the same ways. And so we, we seek um, behaviors and we seek substances to not make us feel um, pain. And so when we think about that, people who have long-term chronic um, diseases like substance misuse, diabetes, and other health disparities, um, what it's tied to is a deep sense of pain. And so he always says, do not ask about the addiction, we should be asking about the pain. And so, um, you know, a full character, characterization of these factors, you know, still awaits further inquiry. And understanding these relationships is important for reestablishing health and wellness in tribal communities. Um, which would benefit the development and implementation of behavioral health, social work, um, and other health interventions, and as well as research methods. Um, and so <clears throat> this is a, a, a model that was developed by uh, Dr. Karina Walters, Jane Simone, and Teresa Evans-Campbell of the University of Washington. Um, and this model of understanding health disparities, you know, we, there's a, a a num there's so much research showing a connection between trauma and health outcomes. Um, in 1995, there was the largest uh, research study conducted on trauma um, ever conducted. Um, the ACEs study, which is the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, um, that showed a, a direct connection between uh, trauma and um, and health outcomes. And um, in that study, you know, they showed that there was these direct correlations. But in that study, that study was really conducted on, um, you know, people who came, who were educated, who health health insurance, um, and who were white. And those studies were not really focusing on the communities that were really impacted uh, by historical trauma, intergenerational trauma. Um, as well as continued racism and oppression in their communities, but it still showed that there was uh, a signet that trauma um, is significant in this country and that it impacts these health outcomes. What Dr. Walters um, and uh, Jane Simone and Tress Evans Campbell said, um, what they were interested in is how do cultural buffers um, mitigate health outcomes? Um, and so what they were looking at is specifically cultural buffers around um, our identities as Native people and culturation um, into uh, our cultures, um, both urban, rural, and, uh, um, and reservation, um, our spiritual coping, and then um, our connection to traditional health practices. And so the... Um, Guidelines for prevention and treatment of the two disorders are very, very similar. The guidance um, and some of the same pharmaceutical interventions that are promising around 
uh, the control of substance misuse are also promising for controlling the intake of food. Few fields seem to offer as much potential for cross-fertilization as the fields of substance misuse and health, um, health outcome research. Some ways that we can address these health issues, um, particularly for American Indian people, is through the integration of health and behavioral health services and the development of intervention practices based on traditional indigenous knowledge. Um, and specifically integrating our traditional food sources into our everyday diets and lifestyles. Um, and recently um, at the board, uh, we, there was a, in our newsletter, there was a publication uh, talking about this. Um, and uh, in the, in the um, Native project, there has been indication that one of the biggest challenges to overcome um, with open access was the communication between different types of providers regarding their patients. And we hear this over and over and over again. There's a disconnect between be behavioral health services and medical services, but there is a movement to integrate um, the care services um, in those communities. And we see in a number of tribal communities um, in the Pacific Northwest, there's a, a movement to uh, integrate, intimately integrate uh, the, the care services so that tribal people um, are getting the best uh, potential uh, services that they can and who are being offered, uh, um, uh, again, a myriad of services and uh, care so that we can address all of these issues um, holistically versus compartmentalizing uh, um, these issues. And so integrating uh, care, integrating diabetes services, integrating behavioral and substance misuse services um, is going to be really helpful for us in moving forward in addressing these very complex social issues. So when we think about treatment, um, you know, scientific knowledge about the involvement of multiple brain circuits would you suggest a multi-model approach to treatment issues. Um, so looking at a harm reduction model where there, we're providing um, as many options for people as, as possible, all the way from 12-step in abstinence only to uh, medicated assisted, assisted treatment, as well as everything in between. Um, and so, and in reinforcing, um, you know, positive behaviors, specifically around reward, motivation, learning, um, and, and, and behavioral control. So a big part of that is like understanding um, and utilizing motivational interviewing techniques. And there's been, Lots and lots of research that shows that when medical providers are trained in motivational interviewing, they can also impact uh, the health behaviors of the, uh, of the patients that they're serving. So it's really important that uh, providers access and get trained in motivational interviewing. Um, motivational interviewing represents a broader kind of therapeutic approach Whereas uh, motivational enhancement therapy includes specific emphasis on personalized assessment feedback, uh, change plans. Um, but meta, meta studies have shown that motivational interviewing um, impacts, affects um, in improving health outcomes, including diet and exercise. If cl clinicians take the time to learn uh, principles of motivational in interviewing, Growing evidence suggests this technique can be effective with patient behaviors behind, beyond uh, substance misuse. Um, and so there's been, like I said, a number of research studies that have showed that when uh, medical providers, health providers are trained in this, they're able to uh, impact the long-term uh, health of the patients that they serve. So one of the things um, that they, that, uh, motivational interviewing, uh, the principles of it um, are uh, these kind, these primary uh, principles. And I do have a little video, but I'm not going to show it. I'll post it in the thread when we're done with the interview um, that talks about the difference between kind of sympathy and empathy. Um, but empathy um, is defined as the accept acceptance facilitates change, ambivalence is normal, 
and reflective listening is fundamental for empathy. Um, a lot of times when we're in a sympathetic uh, kind of mode, we want to fix everything. We want to uh, do, you know, we become task oriented. Um, and empathy is really around listening um, and creating a space that's non judgmental. A lot of times we want to kind of engage in argumentation. Uh, arguments are counterproductive. Um, labeling and the goals, the goal uh, is to provide. Uh, clients new perspectives uh, versus uh, kind of arguing and dictating. Um, and then there's uh, building self-efficacy. Um, building a brief, um, building efficacy is a belief in the possibility um, as is an important motivator. The client is responsible for choosing and carrying out change. When I was doing drug and alcohol counseling before I learned how to do motivational interviewing, my job was like really hard. I just used to get really stuck in, in the argument, uh, you know, the argumentation. Um, I wasn't building self-efficacy, but once I learned about motivational interviewing, my whole job completely shifted and changed. And I was able to work with clients where they're at um, and to help them kind of uh, deal with and promote the discrepancies between what they were saying um, and what they were doing. And another part of it was I learned to roll re with resistance. I always kind of, I became a duck. So I kind of let a lot of that resistance just roll off my back versus getting caught into that resistance and taking it personal. Um, when we are dealing with people who are suffering, who are in pain, um, they tend to become very prickly um, and become really challenging. And it's really just a way of avoiding um, dealing with the pain that they're uh, holding in, in their lives. Um, and so there are kind of different ways of um, directive versus guided communication. And I also have a couple of videos that I'm not gonna show, but I'll also put in into the slide around directive communication versus guided communication. A lot of times in my experience with like medical providers, there tends to be a more directive communication. And many times that's important. You know, we need to be told, you know, how, what to do and how to take our medication and you know, it needs to be directive. But when we're talking about behavior change, um, guided communication um, is much more effective in the long run than directive communication. Um, so if, you know, if we we're to, to, to categorize the different kinds of communication styles that we use with patients, they probably follow under, uh, you know, these two primary uh, characteristics. So when, a directing style of communication cannot be appropriate. Um, it cannot, in long term, it, it can be, uh, it can impact the way that clients are engaging or patients are engaging in, in their long term behavior change. Um, so I want to open it up right now for a couple of questions. I see there's some chat um, before I go in and talk about uh, two of the projects that I've been working on that integrate a more holistic um, perspective to this work. Let me look in the chat. Yeah, I Any think questions? we just had a reference to the book that you were mentioning earlier on, okay. and I think Janine already posted that in there. Great. The Hungry Ghosts. In the realm of the hungry go, it's an excellent Good. book. Good. The other book I would suggest um, reading is called Decolonizing Trauma Work, Indigenous Stories and Strategies by Ren Renee Linkletter. Um, so I wanna talk about two uh, projects that I um, have been involved with that are, uh, that in, you know, address these issues. One of them was my dissertation work. Um, and, and so my dissertation was um, called Our Vision of Health for Future Generations. And it was tied to a project that I worked on with Dr. Karina Walters and Michelle Johnson Jennings uh, called the Yapoli Choctaw Road to Health Project. 
Um, and the Yapoli project, Yapoli in Choctaw means to walk in silence or walk with reverence. Um, and the, uh, this was funded through the National Institutes of Drug Addiction um, under an R01. Um, and we're currently uh, doing the, the final year of the study. But it's a culturally focused, strength-based outdoor experiential obesity and substance use risk prevention and health leadership program. And so there were five of us um, who were all Choctaw uh, doctoral students and then Dr. Walters and Dr. Jens Johnson Jennings who came up with this idea of the Yapoli project. Um, and there's a three month intervention that happens that focuses on our traditional culture and language. Um, we are a matriarchal society traditionally. So this was focused on um, helping Choctaw women kind of reclaim their role as Choctaw women to be um, health leaders um, and the givers and keepers of life. Um, and so there's a three month intervention. It's a group uh, based intervention. Um, and then afterwards, we rewalk the Trail of Tears. Um, and we walk the Trail of Tears from Mississippi um, all the way to uh, Tuscahoma, Oklahoma. Um, and it's a 575 mile journey uh, based on the needs, our abilities of the participants. We walk between 80 and 100 miles over uh, nine days. And um, so we camp. Um, and then we uh, go out to uh, these different parts of the trail. We were able to track some of the trail. Um, some of the trail is not accessible. Some of the trail like goes through Little Rock, Arkansas. Some of it is uh, maintained as a historical site like this picture here. Um, but, um, and this is a picture from Village Creek, um, Arkansas. And this is part of the trail that we know that all of our clans walked. Um, so every living survivor of uh, the Trail of Tears, their ancestor walked um, at this point of the trail. But otherwise, there's multiple trails, but we all know. And so we rewalk that Trail of Tears, and then um, each, each participant is given um, a little bit of money to develop a health promotion initiative in their community um, in the Choctaw Nation. And so, um, you know, so for my, that's the big uh, Yapoli study. Uh, for my dissertation, what I did was I interviewed participants from three of the cohorts um, of, uh, of walkers. And um, I interviewed 25 participants who uh, completed the Yapoli project, including the Walking the Trail of Tears, and completing their community-based um, event in their community. And what I was really interested in was, um, was in, I was interested in looking at and hearing their stories around why they chose to participate in the study, what was their challenges, um, what were their, were there any transformations or healing that came out of it, um, and if there was any embodiment of health and wellness that came out through that experience. And so um, I interviewed the women. And um, so some of the women that walked on the trail, we had one year where there was the oldest participant was 83 years old. Um, the youngest participant of Yapoli um, was uh, 16 years old. So we had in that year, she walked with her mother it was her, her mother, and her grandmother. So we had three generations that walked. Um, in some of the years we had, um, there was one cohort where we had four women who were over 300 pounds when they walked. There was one woman who was 470 pounds when she walked the trail. Many, many of the participants had diabetes, many of them. Um, many had, uh, you know, had been diagnosed with uh, significant and persistent mental health issues, including uh, chronic depression, anxiety. We had one participant who was diagnosed with agoraphobia. Um, so there was also PTSD, lots and lots of issues happening. Um, and so um, when I went back to, you know, the other thing is I um, am a staff volunteer on the trail. 
So, and my job on the trail was to, I was kind of like, they called me the foreman. So I would check every, I would check in with every woman in the morning, make sure I would check their feet because they had diabetes. Um, when we wanted to make sure that their feet were healthy, uh, because we found out the first year that women were not taking care of their feet. Um, they were not eating their food. We provide traditional food on the trail. Um, and they would uh, bring in, you know, we would drive and they would we'd stop for gas and they would go in and sneak in a bunch of like uh, fried fish in particular, um, you know, and chips or Jojo's and, uh, you know, candy and all of this kind of stuff. And then they would refuse to eat the food that we were providing them. That was one of the biggest challenges that we had was getting, we could get them to stop drinking, smoking cigarettes. Uh, doing drugs, but we could not get them to stop eating a uh, high carb, high processed food. It was very, very challenging uh, to get them to eat. And there were some participants who absolutely refused to eat the food that we were providing. Um, but the women who participated um, in the project and really like got into it and changed their diet and ate the food, um, Many of them refused to drink water. They you know, only wanted to have Gatorade. Um, and so these were some of the challenges that we had was that, and those were the biggest challenges that we had. So um, when I interviewed them six months and 12 months post walk, um, the women who I interviewed uh, were really the ones who, uh, who agreed to be interviewed were the ones who participated full, fully in the project. and and benefited much from the project. But there was one woman, um, the woman who was 470 pounds, she, um, she really struggled on the trail as you can probably imagine, but she walked every day. Uh, she participated every day and every day she would go back into her tent and just avoid everyone. She was also the one diagnosed with agoraphobia. And I would go check in with her and she, every day she wanted to go home. She hated it. She didn't want to be there. She was miserable. She would tell me she hated my face. She didn't want to see me. Um, and I would say, I get it. And I hope you stay. You're welcome to go if you want. I hope you stay. And every morning she stayed. Um, at the When I interviewed her, uh, she actually heard I was doing the interviews and reached out to me and asked to be interviewed. And I was thinking, okay, I hope you still don't hate my face. But um, I interviewed her um, six months post walk and she, she was like a different person. And it just was like the whole air of her was different. She was like pink and glowing and like just lighter and happier. Her energy was lighter. She had lost in six months, a hundred pounds, had been walking every day, managing her diabetes uh, with uh, exercise and uh, her diet change, um, she was uh, not, she wasn't taking her high blood pressure medicine anymore. Uh, she was meeting with her per medical provider more frequently um, and engaging with him in a much more uh, positive way. She also, uh, the biggest thing was she went on, uh, she went camping to a music festival in Colorado by herself. This was a woman who literally just hid in her tent every day. Um, and so what we saw was just like incredible amount of change um, and participation um, in that project. And unfortunately we have one more year on the study and it was supposed to the last year uh, was supposed to happen last year, the last walk, but um, because of COVID, we haven't been able to follow through. But women of the Choctaw Nation are still going through the curriculum and participating in the groups. Um, are there any questions about that, that work? Cool. I, ha I have a question. When you yeah. interviewed her, what did she say made the difference for her? Was it was it the walk that that re sort of reintegrating the past with now or healing that? What was it, Danica, that made every, the big difference? 
all of the women I interviewed, it was the walk. Um, it was less the intervention and it was the walk. So when we walk on the trail, we always say we don't want to get stuck in the drama of the trauma. Um, and the reason I called my study Our Vision of Health for Future Generations is because um, when, when my ancestors left Mississippi um, to go to Oklahoma, they left us a, a lot of letters, uh, love letters, saying the reason they're doing this, the reason they're leaving their beloved land, um, and Choctaws are very connected. I mean, all, all tribal people are connected to the land, but we, you know, our, our creation story says that we came out of, out of the mounds um, in Mississippi. And so like to leave was really very hard for Choctaw people, but they decided to leave um, because of, you know, the impact of colonization, and in, in, in particular, the policies of Andrew Jackson at that time with the Indian uh, Removal Act. So, but they decided to go because they wanted to be Choctaw. They wanted to, they wanted their ancestors to be healthy. Um, they wanted them to be happy. Um, and so they left. They had a vision for us. They had a vision of health um, for us, and they loved us, and, and that's why they left. So we would talk about that, and we, we would read those letters from our Choctaw uh, leadership of that time about the love that they had for us, and then we would walk in the places um, where our ancestors walked, and, and through that, there was a transformation. There was a healing of historical trauma that took place for those participants, um, and so it's the walk that actually, there's the knowledge they get from the, the intervention, but it was really integrated in the act of walking that trail of tears. Uh, we Danica, do have another, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, how did you recruit for folks to participate in this program? What were your requirements? In the Yapoli project or in my study? The Yapoli. Um, so the Yapoli project is in collaboration with the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and we have um, Yapoli staff who live in the Choctaw Nation, um, and we work with them very closely. So it's a project that's in the nation, um, and they do recruitment. Um, and so, you know, we have 11 counties, um, and so this we kind of broke up the study into five areas of the nation and so the first year they recruited in that one region and the second year in a separate but they did recruitment but basically it was a lot of it was really like um as you, many of us who do research in tribal communities you find that kind of key stakeholder in that community um and then it kind of snowballs from there um and so and and that even happened in my study um, and in the one year, there was one year um, that, you know, I reached out to a, a leader in, in that community who was also a participant, and she was the one who, you know, was like, oh, I'll get so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so and so my whole recruitment was through that one participant, but that's generally what they would do, but they also put up flyers um, in the community centers, they put uh, ads in the, in the Choctaw newspaper, you know, things like that, but it was really the recruitment came word of mouth. The first year we walked, we had, I think it was uh, 12 participants. Um, and the last year we walked, we had 35 participants, which was our max. So every year we get more and more and more uh, participation. Now that the world, word is out that this is a, a project that's worth participating in. Eric, there a chat question? Yeah, there was one question about longevity. Uh, Kenny Jackson is asking, you know, have you seen any changes this year due to the pandemic with any of the women who had originally done well? So one of the uh, projects that one of the women um, and her sister started um, was actually a, a Facebook group called Walking Warriors. And a lot of the uh, Choctaw women um, are part of that walking group. And so they do, uh, they work, walk together and exercise together, but they post things on their Facebook group. Um, and I'm a, a member of that walking group too. There's people actually all over the world who are part of that walking group now. 
Um, and so I get to follow, um, you know, I get to see people and, and the woman that I was talking about that I interviewed um, where I saw significant changes. This is four years later now, and she um, is still losing um, her body weight and she is still engaging in the work. And all of the participants who are part of that group are still, um, you know, their behavior has changed for the long term. We, for the study, because it's an uh, NIDA study, we have a, a great deal of health um, re, uh, data that we're collecting on all of the participants um, for five years. Unfortunately, because of our IRB protocol, we can't look at that data until the study is completed, but we will have uh, five, five years of data on each of the cohorts um, when we finally get to finish the project and look at that data. I wish I could say that I had more, except for the anecdotal uh, data that I have just observing uh, the, through that Facebook group. Any other questions? I think we're good. We're at 15 okay. minutes, just letting you know, uh, left in the hour, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the other project um, that I'm working on uh, currently uh, is a project through the Centers for Disease Control uh, Injury Prevention, and it's through the tribal opioid uh, projects uh, through them. And <clears throat> we're, it's called the 49 Days of Ceremony. Um, and the 49 Days of Ceremony, again, is a health promotion initiative. And although the, the focus is on substance misuse, what we're really talking about is how do we become, um, you know, how we become good human beings, how do we become healthy human beings. Um, and so this is in collaboration with the CDC and Alaska Native Health Consortium, um, Good Health Medicine. Um, and we've been working with two elders up in Alaska, Doug and Amy Modig. And uh, 49 Days of Ceremony is, um, is uh, intervention, it, it can, 49 Days of Ceremony is the life and heart work of Doug and Amy Modig. Um, and so we have been working with them to kind of take this idea of 49 Days of Ceremony um, and turn it into a community intervention. Um, and so the intervention applies to an indigenous framework for conceptualizing health and encourages individuals to live full and balanced lives through engaging in traditional indigenous wellness and healing practices by applying ancestral knowledge and reflecting on indigenous teachings. Uh, the 49 days of ceremony, like I said, is the life work of Doug and Amy Modug, both of them who are experienced community organizers who have supported countless individuals through long-term behavior change and using traditional methods. So the 49 days of ceremony is based on seven aspects of health and wellness. Uh, this includes the you know, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual components, uh, Mother Earth, which represents our connection to all living things, um, Father Sky, which represents our connection to our ancestors um, and the spiritual realm, but this is also where we get our ancestral knowledge, those creation stories that are passed down uh, from generation to generation. And then on the outside of this is um, how it's in relationship to community. And at the center of it is us as the individuals and the way that we really perceive um, this is through this idea of the fire within. So a big part of the 49 days of ceremony is how do we light a fire uh, to, you know, to change our behavior, to connect with our ancestral knowledge and our communities. Um, the intervention itself is a, is a, uh, a it's a community-based intervention um, that's a project. So we're piloting this, the, the project right now in a, a community in Alaska where we're doing a canoe journey. Um, so the, prog the intervention again is like a year long process. And so there's uh, different principles of the canoe, you know, utilizing the canoe journey. 
Um, and there's different stages of the 49 days of ceremony. It's seven days and seven weeks. Um, how it doesn't have to be in consecutive order, it can be longer or shorter. But there's a planning phase. So the planning is part of the ceremony where you connect with your community, you find out who your resources are, what resources you need. In this particular case, we're working with this Alaska Native community. Uh, we have, uh, you know, canoe builders who are going to teach everyone how to do the canoe, build the canoe. Um, and then there's the implementation of the journey. So they're going to build the canoe and hopefully next year we'll be able to actually do the journey. Um, and then the last uh, phase of it is the reflection and prayer where we think about the journey and what we learned in those lessons. Um, and part, oops, part of it is um, also under, you know, we have and working with um, the community, what we call the um, aunt and uncle, aunt, auntie and uncle society. So there's the intervention is usually is directed at people who are 18 to 24 years old. And essentially it's a rite of passage to light that, you know, that internal flame, that sacred flame inside. But it's the auntie and uncle society that are the uh, facilitators of the 49 days of ceremony. Um, so are there any questions about that? Everyone's so quiet. We need to get a yelling session going on here. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Donica. Do we have any questions? It looks like we have about, oh, almost a full 10 minutes, nine minutes left in the hour. So we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, feel free to leave them in the chat or just if you want to unmute yourself, go ahead and do so. Um, if you're on the phone, make sure you st uh, press star six and that'll help out, but I'll leave it to the floor for any questions. Um, Danica, what were some of the other projects that the women uh, selected to take to do in their community or the other events um, besides the Facebook Walking Warriors? Yeah, um, so one group of women um, in uh, one of in one of the districts, they did um, and are still doing uh, uh, um, a half marathon. <clears throat> and so they started coordinating this uh, walk and run. It's a half marathon in Mar uh, I can't remember this town. At any rate, that's one of them. They've done I think three of those ma uh, half marathons. Uh, a number of communities. Uh, just wanted to do uh, community gardens. Um, and so I think there, last time I checked, there was three community gardens at three of the community centers. Um, and those were still happening and going because they were collaborating with the Choctaw Nation uh, to get the soil and the seeds and all of that. Um, one, of, uh, one of those gardens is a, a medicine garden uh, so it's not a, a fruit and vegetable garden, and that one is specifically was uh, was done by the a group of elders that participated in that second year walk. Um, and I've been to that garden; it's it's quite lovely. And then um, another one of the groups uh, they did a, a community health fair, and I'm not sure if they were able to continue doing it, but I know that they did at least one community health fair. So those are some of the ideas that they did. Whoops, I meant to turn my sound on, turn my camera back on. Sorry, <laughs> issues, so I had to turn my camera off. I just wanted to ask maybe some of the um, diabetes coordinators if, if you guys are doing anything, not similar, but like support groups and uh, women's walking groups or talking circles or crafts stuff that maybe is kind of similar to what Donica is talking about just for that support and and also like your own tribal um, historical trauma that we've all dealt with here in the northwest we have different history so I'm just curious 
if, if any of our own programs are doing groups or history or anything like that. So this is Michelle with the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic. This is my first time to attend and I do appreciate your presentation, Donica. Um, we received the TIPWIC grant, the Tribal Practices for Wellness in Indian Country from the CDC. And with that grant, we have started to incorporate activities with our intergenerational activities for mothers, grandmothers, daughters, and that included beading and shawl making. We've also been able to incorporate some dancing, traditional dancing with that group. But I will say in particular, the beading and the shawl making seems to have had a bigger impact on um, perceived total wellness and, and certainly the support they're able to provide each other. I, I will say too that we have adapted the Appley model to other uh, tribal communities. Um, we've adapted, um, we adapted it with the Huma Nation in Louisiana. Um, and their journey was um, a canoe across the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we've also adapted the Yapoli project in New Zealand with the Maori um, people. And so there have been um, adaptations of that, that model um, in other indigenous communities. I, I think that one of the common things that Native people experience, Indigenous people all over the world, is the removal of people from their Indigenous homelands to different places. And so there's lots of journeys, you know, um, that can happen, um, whether it's, and, you know, and then in the Pacific Northwest, we have the canoe journey. Um, and although this is not like an intervention, we see across the communities that engage in canoe journey, um, you know, are having uh, better outcomes with health and engaging people in behavior change. Well, and actually Oregon has a, a tribal best practice. It's a canoe journey. Yeah. One tribal best practices here in Oregon. I saw there are a couple of folks on, so um, they're, they are really, awesome to read when you get your hands on those tribal best practices. So thank you, like I really appreciate it. Okay, you have a few uh, nice comments in there on the chat box if you wanna see them, you're more welcome to, but definitely um, an amazing presentation. Thank you so much for that, Donica. Uh, it's really nice to hear, hear stories of um, you know, struggle that we go through and then the outcome to be a better, healthier lifestyle. That's that's truly amazing work that you did there and, and you continue to do. So we appreciate you coming on board. It's great to have you. It's always good to uh, integrate the behavioral health issues that come along with the health disparities. So it's definitely a deeper issue than, that, you know, we, we tend to believe, but it's really nice to hear that. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, let me see here. Yep, a lot of thank yous from Grace and Caroline, and Tashina and Kenny. <laughs> Everybody loved it. So thank you so much. Um, if there are no other questions, uh, again, there is the survey monkey that Janine popped up for you guys. Uh, any um, credits and whatnot, or just to sign in, that would be awesome if you guys select that link. And I think we can call it a close if there's nothing else we want to say. Nope. You guys, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you all next month, huh?